This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural lesson today comes from the 20th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, and uh, verse 1 through 8 here from the New Living Translation of Scripture. Notice there these words. When you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, do not be afraid. The Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, is with you. When you prepare for battle, the priest must come forward to speak to the troops. And he will say to them, listen to me, all you men of Israel, do not be afraid as you go out to fight your enemies today. Do not lose heart or panic or tremble before them, for the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies, and he will give you victory. And then the officers of the army must address the troops and say, Has anyone here just built a new house but not yet dedicated it? If so, you may go home. You, may, you might be killed in the battle and someone else would dedicate your house. Has anyone else here just planted a vineyard but not yet eaten any of its fruit? If so, you may go home. You might die in battle and someone else would eat uh, the fruit first. Has anyone here just become engaged to a woman but yet not yet married her? Well, you may go home and get married. You might die in the battle and someone else would marry her. And then the officers will also say, is anyone here afraid or worried? If you are, you may go home before you frighten anyone else. I want to talk today simply from the subject, battle ready, battle ready, battle ready. One thing is clear. Either you just came out of a battle or you're in a battle or you're headed into a battle. There are so many battles that the world in this life uh, has to present to us. So the best that you can do is just be battle ready, whatever it is, be battle ready. And uh, there are various ways that, that you get ready for a battle. Battles require preparation, they require training, they require practice. So we have to be ready for the battle. It's not a matter of if you're going to have a battle. The question is when you're going to have a battle. You're going to have battles in this life. See, thank God that when we get to heaven, there are no enemies there. So there'll be no warring once you get to that place. But we're not there yet. So in this land, you will deal with things that will battle your very soul. Uh, there, there will be battles against your mind. There will be battles against your health. There will be battles against your marriage. There will be battles against your parental relationship with your children. There are going to be battles on your job, financial battles. There, there are stress battles. There, there are just things that are just warring and battling with us on every level of life. So you can't stop the battles from coming. All you can do is get ready for them, be prepared for them when they come. And here's the truth that you have to always be aware of, is that the time to be ready is not the time to get ready. So that's why we're talking about battle ready, battle ready, battle ready. We are in a time right now of battles, 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 economic battles, political battles, health battles. We are in a time of battle. This is a battle season. This is a time of spiritual warfare, where the kingdoms of this world are in stark opposition against the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. 
and the devil has released demons into this earth. There are some people who get too educated to even believe in demons and not even recognize it. When a demon is a spirit that is filling their spouse or working in their children or working uh, on their job against them, you better realize there is a devil. There's something to war. You can call it yin yang, good and evil. I don't care what you call it, but there's something in this life that you're going to have to battle. And so you may as well just get ready for the battle. And be battle ready. you got to be battle ready. This is what this is about, is about being battle ready. I love uh, the words of Norman Schwarzkopf, who, who said that the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. We say it this way sometimes, that the more sweat lost in training or in practice, the less blood lost in battle. So it, you, you may as well just get ready, just, just practice, just, just get ready because there's, there's, a, there's a war going on. We are in a time of spiritual warfare. This is a time for spiritually sensitive people to realize that we're in the battle of our lives. We're not only in the, just the battle of our lives, we're in the battle for the morality of, of Scripture, for the authenticity of truth still being accepted where God is on the, on the throne. We're, we're in a battle. We're in a battle for holding uh, sane things, you know, just common sense where we're living in a day now where common sense is not so common. We're in a battle just to have sanity, of having some mores in our society that keeps us from becoming chaotic because chaos is when everybody does what is right in their own eyes. This culture calls it living your own truth. The Bible calls it doing what you think is right in your own eyes. The Bible says that there is a way that seemeth right unto man in his own eyes, but the end thereof is destruction. And so we are in a battle. We are in a spiritual battle. This is a, this is a battle cry. This is a sounding an alarm for the spiritual warriors to, to wake up and to get ready because it's, it's wartime. We are in spiritual warfare right now. And warriors must be prepared on different levels. Number one, warriors must be prepared spiritually. You know why? Because we are fighting an invisible enemy. You can't see the coronavirus with your naked eye. Uh, we are fighting an invisible enemy enemy. So we've got to fight spiritually. And I want you to understand this very carefully, that the first line of defense in spiritual warfare is prayer. You got to win the war in the prayer, in the prayer realm first. It's time now to get your prayer life together. You might have been slacking off during other times and just waiting. And, and, and I hope that all of your faith is just not in a vaccine. Because we've got some deeper things going on in the world. A vaccine is not going to cure racism in a person's heart. A vaccine is not going to uh, cure injustice in the corporate world. A vaccine is not going to cure sex trafficking. A, a, a vaccine is not going to cure uh, abortion and all of these other things that are antithetic to the very nature of God. So we've got to win this thing in the realm of the spirit in prayer. you got to war in prayer in the spirit realm first. You've got to be prepared spiritually. Your real victory before you win it in the natural, you got to win it in the spirit. you got to, what the old folks used to say, you got to pray through. 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 When you pray through, you still realize that you'll never get through praying. This is why the Bible says, Pray always, always with all kinds of prayer. You got to always be constant in prayer. But the real victory is won in the spirit realm before it is ever won in the natural. So this is a time that we must be prepared spiritually. Warriors must be prepared spiritually. Secondly, warriors must be prepared mentally, mentally. Because when you really think about it, real intense warfare happens at its most serious level in between your ears. It is the warfare that happens in between your ears. The thoughts that bombard your mind, the doubts that come there, the discouragement that arises, the frustration that happens in you. This, this war happens in between your ears. You've got to be prepared mentally. That's why you gird up the loins of your mind. You gotta, this is for battle. This is, this, is a, this is a battle term. 
This is a battle term about girding up the loins of your mind. you got to get your mind ready that I'm going into a fight here. And when you step into certain atmospheres, not everybody is going to be welcoming you and celebrating you. Talking about Hercules, Hercules. No, no, no. Somebody is trying to take you out. They're going to be trying to take you out. And you got to realize, I've got to be spiritually ready. I've got to be mentally ready. Thirdly, I've got to be physically ready. And there are some people that, that are all hyped up and they, they prayed up and everything. And then if you don't get ready for the battle physically, you got to get your body ready. You, you got to get your spirit ready. You got to get your mind ready. You got to get your body ready. That's what boot camp is about. It's basic training to get your body ready for it. When you go to war, you bring a different level of stress into your system. And your body has to be ready to handle that from physical training, from the nutrition that you put in your body, from the rest that you give yourself. You got to strengthen your immune system. You got to fight physically. You got to fight mentally. You got to fight spiritually. Here's the next area. You got to be prepared technically. Technically. In uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible talks about those uh, children of Israel, that, uh, a certain tribe there, that they were skilled in war. They were skilled in war. That's a technical training that you have to have. The Bible says that they carried shields and swords and that they were also good with bows and arrows. You've got to be technically skilled to know how to work the equipment. You got to be technically skilled, technically skilled, spiritually uh, uh, ready, mentally ready, physically ready, technically ready, financially ready. You know why? Because war is big business and you have to finance war. War always has a huge budget. I, one of our biggest budgets in America is our military budget. We probably spend more on our military than any government on the planet. Because there's a financial preparedness that you have to have in order to be ready for warfare. You've got to spend money in order to, to get yourself ready to have the best kind of equipment and the, the latest technology. All of the kinds of, of spyware. Whatever it is that is necessary, these things have to be financed. So you've got to be ready spiritually. You've got to be ready mentally. You've got to be ready physically, technically, financially, and then familially. Familially, that means that you've got to get your family ready. You know why? Because if you ever get in a battle personally, it's not just you in the battle. Everybody that's attached to you that loves you is also battling with you. When you've got mama that's dealing with an issue, if somebody has cancer, it's not just the person that's in the bed, it's everybody who loves them. It's everybody that cares about them. It's everybody who's connected to their life. It's the whole family goes in the battle. The whole family battles cancer together. The whole family battles leukemia. The whole ba family battles a heart attack, stroke, memory loss. The whole family deals with that. It impacts the whole family. And that's why when there's a crisis that the family bands together and you draw strength from one another because when there's a battle that's going on, the whole family suffers together. You battle as a family because when the devil comes, he comes to the household. He wants to mess up everything in the house. He doesn't just want baby boy. He wants baby girl. He wants mama. He wants daddy. He wants brother. He wants sister. He wants cousin. He wants auntie. He wants grandma. He's coming after everything that is attached to you. He wants your family. The devil wants your family. He's going after the family that God gives you because God gave a promise to Abraham saying, Abraham, through you shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. He's coming after your family. No wonder they're family feuds. He's coming after the family. He's coming after the family. You've got to recognize him. You've got to recognize him. And I want to let you know that because we've got to be ready in all of these areas spiritually and mentally and physically and technically and financially and familially, this is a wake-up call to us to say that you've got to fight with everything you've got. You've got to fight with everything you've got. You've got, you've got to fight with your spirit. You've got to fight with your mind. You've got to fight with your hands. He teaches my hands to war. 
you got to fight with your words. You've got to fight with confessions coming out of your mouth. You've got to fight with your friends. You've got to fight with your relationships. You've got to fight with everything that you've got. You don't just fight with the Bible. You fight with everything that you've got. You fight with your diet. You fight with your friends. You fight with your family. You fight with every available resource that God gives you. Fight with everything that you've got. If you ever get in a real pickle, you don't say, well, I don't have a shotgun. If you got a golf club, if you got a stick, if you got a rock, you fight with whatever you've got. You've got to fight with everything you've got. You've got to fight with everything you've got. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 2, notice this, that when you prepare for battle, the priest must come forward to speak to the troops. The priest must come forward to speak to the troops. And what does the priest say? Here's what the priest does. The priest reminds the troops that you are not to fear. You are not to fear. The first thing, you are not to fear. Because the worst thing that you can do is to go into a battle scared to death. You better psych yourself out. You better talk to yourself. You better say, you know what, God's with me. The priest comes to let them know you are not to fear. Be not afraid. Fear not, fear not, fear not. And he also told them to tell them, the Lord is going with you. You're not in this thing alone. You may feel alone. You may not see him, but you feel him. You feel him. He's there. God will show you signs. When you're struggling, you can be going through the worst battle in your life, but you'll know that somehow God has strengthened me in my spirit. God is with me. You won't be able to explain it. You got down to your last, last dime, and sometimes the blessing that comes in might not be enough to put you out, but it's enough to be a wink from God to say, I got you. I see you. I see you. I see you, and I'm still on your side. I'm with you. And he said to remind the people that the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. We are not even aware of all of the enemies that are trying to work against us, and that's why the Bible says that the Lord will fight for you. Because you don't, don't even know when the Spirit of the Lord, when the enemy comes in like the flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. You don't know what all God is keeping from coming your way. At every intersection that you get ready to cross, there could be a car to come there and slam and take your life out. And God is staying the hand of the enemy. Yeah, you might deal with some things, but you don't know the stuff that God is shielding you from because the Lord is fighting for you. This person's child got locked up and your child was there and you it was only God shielding are you listening to me the Lord is fighting for you in areas that you don't even realize that the Lord is on your side the Lord is with you and then he, he said the priest was to remind them that the Lord will give you victory the Lord will give you victory thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord the Lord will give you the victory the victory the battle is the Lord's but the victory is ours the battle is the Lord's, but the victory is ours. The battle is the Lord's, but the victory is ours. God gives us the victory. God gives us the victory. He says, priests, before they go out for battle, I want you to remind them of that. Don't fear. Don't fear. These are the same things that you need to walk through today. I don't care what's happening in our government with the, uh, politically. I don't care what's happening in, with the pandemic. You are not to fear. The Lord is going with you. The Lord will fight for you, and the Lord will give you victory. Though a thousand fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, it shall not come nigh me. Are you listening? I'm, I'm just, you better just realize the Lord is fighting for me. The Lord is fighting for me. Even if it hits a person, the Lord, it is the Lord that will raise you back up. It is the Lord that heals you. It is the Lord that sustains you. The Lord is with me. You got to be battle ready. You got to realize we are in a battle, but the Lord is with me. And thanks be unto God that gives me the victory. My God, he's come and decimated the finances of people, but we still here. We still here. We still here. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. I just came as a priest today just to remind you, you are not to fear that the Lord is with you. The Lord will fight for you and the Lord will give you the victory. The Lord will give you the victory. The Lord will give you the victory. I'm prophesying to somebody right now. The Lord will give you the victory. The victory. Victory. Victory shall be mine. Victory. 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 Victory is yours. It belongs to you. The battle is the Lord's, but Jesus gives us the victory. Yes, he does.
you to understand this. God had an order in terms of getting his people battle ready. In terms of getting them battle ready, there's a reason why he begins to enumerate for us here in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that the priest was to come out and speak to the people even before the military officers. And let me tell you why. Because if you deal with a people that gets discouraged in their spirit, it doesn't matter what kind of training they get. If my spirit is discouraged, I don't want to fight. It's like they can have the house, they can have the car, they can have the account, they can have my stuff. When your spirit gets tired, let me, let me just tell you this, people don't quit because they get tired, people quit because they get discouraged. So God said, I need a priest to come and to speak from the heart of God, to speak life, to inspire to speak power, to give life, and to encourage them, to put them in courage, to put them in faith, to put them in strength, in believing and in trusting in God. He says, that's what I need a priest for so that the people do not become discouraged because we don't quit when we get tired. We quit when we get discouraged. If you cook for somebody and they never thank you and always complain, you'll get discouraged and after a while you'll say, you cook it yourself. We don't quit because we get tired. We quit because we get discouraged. And so God says, I need a priest to come and to talk to the people. But I'm not a man of war, so I only do what I do as a priest. And the generals have to do, it, and the sergeants and the battalion commanders have to do what they need to do in terms of preparing your hands for war. So it's not just on the priests. When you want to be battle ready, you need more than just spiritual training. Are you listening? That's why you go to school. So get yourself ready. You can't just put everything on God. You can't just put everything on the Bible and on prayer. That's a part of it. There's a God part and then there's a man part to every battle. There's a God part and there's a man part to every battle. This is why he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 5. Notice this. Then the officers of the army must address the troops and say, has anyone here just built a new house and not yet dedicated it? And if so, he says, you may go home. You might be killed in the battle and someone else would dedicate your house. Let me tell you what he's saying in essence as he began to enumerate these things. This is where the officers of the army, the military officers come. The officers of the army addresses the troops to release those with unfinished business. He, they, they came to release those with unfinished business. You know why? Because you cannot fight with a divided mind. You can't fight with a divided mind. You can't fight with a divided mind. And he's, he begins to tell them, he says, those who have built a house but not yet dedicated it, you may be dismissed. He says, those who have planted a vineyard but not yet eaten its fruit, you may be dismissed. And those who are engaged but not married, you may be dismissed. I bet some folk put a ring on it then. <laughs> you, you know, no, no, baby, you know what I mean? I wasn't scared of anything because, you know, I was going to do this anyway. <laughs> and then he says, those who are fearful or worried, you may be dismissed. You know why I told the scared folks to be dismissed? Because fear is contagious. I mean, I don't want to be uh, going to war and I'm, I'm in there to, in the trenches with somebody and somebody, man over here crying because he's like, man, man, we ain't going to never, we ain't going to never get, man, I ain't going to be home, man, I'm going to write a letter to my wife. Man, you give it to her, something happened to me. I'm like, dude, get out of here. Get out of my face. Get out of my face. You going over there. Because fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. I don't want to be in a pickle in the man, 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 man. We're doomed. <laughs> man, we're going to die. And I'm going to take my cell phone. I'm going to get my last. Uh, Pookie, I, I love you. Uh, baby boy, you know, you remember we all had a good time together and everything. Listen, I, I don't want anybody. I, I, if I'm in a battle, I don't want to be next to somebody who's given their last will and testament. I want to be next to Joshua and Caleb. They said, we are well able to go up and possess this land. I want to be with somebody that's, that's, that's uh, like a Joan of Arc, a little girl, 19 years old, who risked her life and her courage 
encouraged the men. And she went over the hill and then all of the men followed her because courage is also contagious. Fear is contagious, but so is courage. Worry is contagious, but so is faith. And she bristled it up and encouraged faith in the lives of other people because there was something on the inside of her that rose up. It takes courage when you see an Esther that lives with a type of a determination. If I perish, I perish. But at least I died doing what I was called to do. She said, yeah, I'm scared, but I'm going in how I'm going to do it. And if I die, let me go with somebody like that. But I don't want to deal with somebody who's like, oh, man, we, we probably ain't going to be, this going to be our last time. You're not on death row. Being battle ready does not mean you're on death row. You got to be prepared to die, but be mentally and spiritually prepared to live and to fight. And let me just remind you of this. Never go to a battle without a strategy. Never go to a battle without a strategy. The word strategy is a military term. It is a military term of where you plan strategic attacks of the enemy. Sometimes it's to create a commotion over here to draw them this way and then you, bet, uh, you, know, you ambush them from the back and the front. You got to have a strategy. There are so many wars that are lost because people go into into a battle with no strategy. There has to be a place for everybody in the battle. When you are in war, everybody has to have an assignment and they have to be in their place. It's, it's the word of God. Judges chapter 7, verse 21. Notice this. And every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. They were victorious here in battle, the children of Israel. You know why? Because every person was in their place. That was a strategy. They said, we got to have you stationed here, you stationed here, you stationed here. That was the strategy of God. God gave them a strategy. God gave them a strategy. The whole purpose of divine wisdom, wisdom always produces a strategy. Wisdom produces a strategy. You never go to war without a strategy. Every person has got to be in their place. If you're in accounting, you win because you got the accounting person in their place, the marketing person in their place, the salesperson in their place. You got to have everybody in their place, the cleaning crew in their place, the hospitality, the welcoming crew has to be in their place. Everything works and functions and you win because everybody understands their assignment, their role, and they are in their place, not trying to run somebody else's job. If you drive a tank, don't try to fly the plane. You win the war because you've got an assignment in that war, in that battle, and every person is in their place of assignment, and that's a strategy toward winning. But please remember that you've got to choose your battles wisely. Not every battle is worth fighting. Don't fight unnecessary battles. Some things are not worth your losing your peace over. Choose your battles wisely. Choose your battles wisely. Remember, wisdom is simply knowing what to ignore. You don't have to get in a fight about everything. Some things is not all that deep. I mean, the very people that are talking about your mama, they don't even know her. Don't, don't, don't get in a, a battle and get put out of school and lose your job because somebody, you know, start talking about your mama. You know, don't, don't lower your standard just because somebody else refuses to raise theirs. You've, you've got to choose your battles wisely. Don't get into battles that are driven by your ego. Don't, don't do it. You know, you have to ask yourself this question. Is the thing that I'm ready to fight over now, will it, would it matter in five years from now? I mean, really, would it, would it matter? You'd be surprised at the stupid stuff that people have divorced over. They don't even think long term. They're, they're, it's, it's the heat of the moment that creates a passion. And they're like, I mean, will this really matter? What we are dealing with right now, would this really matter 10 years from now? And if it's not going to make it, if, if it's not going to matter 10 years from now, don't let it destroy what you've got right now. Work through it. Battle through it. Battle through it. You see, there, there's, there's this thing that's called a Pyrrhic victory. Pyrrhic victory, it is a victory or a goal that is achieved at too great a cost. It means that you win the war or the battle 
but it costs you too much. It costs you too much. And there's some people that get Pyrrhic victories that say, you know, man, you know what? Man, I finally got this house into my dream house. But if your dream house costs you your marriage, if it costs you your relationship with your mom and your daddy and all of your friends in your inner circle, and, and, and if it costs you, you have to sell all your stock and you have to, you have to take money out of your full 1K plan. Yeah, you got the house. That's a Pyrrhic victory. You want it, but it costs you too much. It costs you too much. You can't afford everything. And that's why you don't try to build a house unless you first count the, the cost. You can have a Pyrrhic victory. Pyrrhic victory. That's, it's like you got the stuff, but it's all financed on credit at 21 and 23 percent. And you look like you won because you walk around with Gucci and Louis Vuitton. That's a Pyrrhic victory. It's a Pyrrhic victory when you're paying on it every month. That's a Pyrrhic victory. It costs you too much. It costs you too much. By the time you finance it, you paid for it two and three times, four and five times. Pyrrhic victory. It looked like you won. But it costs you too much. That's why you choose your battles carefully. Don't let people talk about your car if it's paid for. And when you go get a new, you still got that same old, you still dealing. You, man, how many, you got 250,000 miles. It's paid for. It's paid for. It's paid for. And, 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 and the note that you're saving on that, you're investing it someplace else. You, you, you're doing some other thing. You're working on something. So it may not look like what it is. You don't have to display every dime that you've got. Those are Pyrrhic victories. I just remind you of this, that in matters of style, swim with the current, but in matters of principle, stand like a rock. You got to understand certain things that are the principles. That's what you fight for. You fight for principles. You fight for truth. Policies are many, principles are few. Policies often change, principles never do. So, in matters of style, swim with the current. Doesn't matter how you do it, it's just, that's fine. That's a flexible thing. But in matters of principle, stand like a rock. Stand like a rock. And let me remind you of this let going to a battle be your last alternative. You know, there are some folks that just have a, a violent, belligerent spirit. They just, they just want to fight. They're just angry and they, they're looking for somebody to fight. Don't let fighting be your first resort. Let it be your last resort. Notice what Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10 says. As you approach a town to attack it, you must first offer its people terms for peace. And if the people accept the terms for peace, you avoid a war. He's like, let the battle be your last alternative. Offer them terms of peace. Let's try to have an agreement. Let's see if we can work this out. Try to work it out first. The Bible teaches that. If you've got a conflict with somebody, go to your brother. Go to your sister. Try to go and then take them before the church to see if you can get another witness and, 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 and try to work it out and get somebody to arbitrate it for you. And he said, let dragging them to the law, to the court, be the last alternative. Let that be the last alternative. Sometimes you have to go there, but let that be the last alternative, not the first resort. You have to realize that whenever your child is, is upset, as a parent, it can trigger something in you to get upset too. And then you find yourself reacting instead of responding. Just because a child is pitching a fit. And now you match their behavior by reacting to their fit and you have a fit. Our job as parents is to share our calm and not join in on their chaos. It is to, it's to share our calm. Because when a child is having a conniption right in front of you, in the store, in a restaurant, and they're embarrassing you. It is not to join in in their insane, irascible behavior. 
but it is to share our calm to say, okay, Pookie, what did we talk about before we left home? We don't do that. Not, this is not the way that we get it done. Would you like to go in the restroom for a visit? <laughs> share your calm. Share your calm. Remember this, that he who angers you controls you. And I watch parents manipulated by their children all the time because they anger them. They, instead of their parents sharing their calm, the child spreads their irritation. And the parent ends up reacting to the child instead of responding. Children who are upset need a calm voice. I know what it is. I had to get out of my car one time at an accident. The woman who had had a terrible accident and I saw that she was in hysteria in her vehicle, paralyzed by the fear of what had just happened to her. And I got out of my car and went to her in a very calm voice. I saw the blood. I saw the broken glass. And I said, honey, can you hear me? My voice was so calm. There was such a calm and composure in my voice. I didn't let the panic of the tragedy of her situation alarm her. I didn't know whether she had a concussion and internal bleeding or not. But what I did know is that there was a God that moved me to get out of my car and to speak prophetically and to share my calm and such a peaceful calm because had I looked in her window and screamed, she might have fainted. So instead of my entering into her hysteria, I shared my calm. When you are battle ready, you come into a situation, instead of being alarmed, you share your calm. Instead of being alarmed, learn to share your calm. You can only share your calm when you have been to that place with God. When you have entered into the secret place and you have talked to Him and you have been reassured that the Lord is with me. And the Lord is fighting for me. And the Lord is giving me victory. When I am assured of that, it gives me a calm. And just knowing that everything is going to be all right, share your calm. Share your calm. Share your calm. That's why you need grandmothers and grandfathers. So that when you're going through something and you think it's the end of the world, Grandmama look at him and said, baby, stay there. You think your granddaddy has always been what he is today? <laughs> baby, I had to pray too. You can pray through this. You need a coach to come up beside you at times. Are you listening? Who has been through a storm and has found a peace from God. And instead of coming into your whirlwind, they share their calm. You got to learn that while the world is in turmoil, somebody has got to share the calm. Share the calm. Share the calm. Share the calm. Because God, He really wants to help us hold your peace. Because sometimes you realize you cannot make war. You cannot make peace with a man who has war in his heart. You got to just know when it's just smarter for you to just hold it. Hold it. And before you go into war, there are certain things that you need to know. Number one, know your weapons. Know your weapons. Know your weapons. The Word of God is a weapon. The name of Jesus is a weapon. The blood of Jesus is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon. Praise and worship are weapons. Your testimony is a weapon. And wise, godly counsel is a weapon. Know your weapon. You have an arsenal of weapons. Screenshot it so you'll just be reminded of the weapons that God has made available to you. You have an arsenal, and this is not an exhaustive list. But this is a list of some of the essential weapons that God has equipped you with with every battle. 
with every battle. And you have to realize that when David fought Goliath, there were things that he had to know. He had to know that he couldn't use Saul's armor because he was unfamiliar with it. So you don't go to war with unfamiliar or unproven weapons. Secondly, I want to encourage you to know your God. Know your God. Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 and 32 says that the king of the north will send his army to make the temple in Jerusalem unclean. And he will stop the people from offering the daily sacrifice. And then they will set up a blasphemous object that brings destruction. There's a war in the spirit realm that's trying to disrupt people's worship of God, their devotion to God. But then the king of the north will tell lies and cause those who have not obeyed God to be ruined. But those who know God and obey him will be strong and fight back. The King James Version says that they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Know your God. Certain things when you're in a battle that you've got to know. Thirdly, you've got to know your enemy. Know your enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8 says to stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That means that he can't devour everybody. That's why he's looking for somebody that he can devour. When you're rooted in God, he cannot devour you. He's looking for the person. It's just like a bully. bully knows who, uh, a bully knows who to mess with. They know who they can bully and they know who they can't. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. Know that the devil is your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. The devil is the enemy. Your child is not your enemy. The devil is the enemy. 2 Corinthians 2.11 reminds us of this, that I have done this so that they might not be taken advantage of by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. You got to know the schemes, the devices of the devil. You got to know the tactics that the devil will use to come against you. And some of the most deadly enemies are practically invisibly to us. They are invisible. They may be self uh defeating negative thoughts that can sometimes be your worst enemy. Social media can sometimes be your enemy. Worry and anxiety, toxic relationships. The devil is trying. You got to know your enemy. You got to know your enemy. That's why the devil is trying to discourage you. You got to know your enemy. You got to know your enemies. And also you have to know your allies. Know your allies. God says you're not alone. You're not alone. You're fighting with somebody else. Exodus 32 and 26 says, So we stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, All of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. You got to sometimes issue out a call when you're in a battle and you'll see your, your allies. You'll see your allies. God has called people to join alongside you. And then finally, you've got to know how to remain surrendered to and dependent on God. How to remain surrendered to and dependent on God. You discover in the, in the story of Exodus 17, here Moses, they're in the biggest battle of their life. And they discover that as, as Moses' arms are lifted up, they win the battle. But when he, in his humanity, his tiredness, and his arms start lowering, they start losing. Isn't it amazing that if you can just sometimes just have lifted up arms, and Moses has given us a great key here, we raise our arms when we surrender. When you surrender, you stop the war. You stop the battle by our surrendering to God. And the more you surrender to God, as you surrender to God, then you will prevail over your enemies. And, and the Bible says that when, when it, through his tiredness, his hands started coming down, when his hands came down, the enemy started prevailing. 
when you stop surrendering to God, the enemy has a field day in your life. Keep your guards up. There are people that started off and the hands were lifted up. They were surrendered to God. And then they get in the journey. And they get weary. And then they wonder why they're losing. It's because you've stopped your surrender to God. And now the enemy is wreaking havoc. But there are people that God has called alongside you. The Joshua and her. And do you know what they did? They got a big rock and brought it so that Moses could sit on the rock. We know that the rock is Jesus. He says, I'm with you. You got to learn to be able to rest on him. Jesus is the rock. But even though Jesus is the rock, they needed some allies. Her and Joshua had to hold his arms up. May I tell you that even in the weariness of your flesh that God will bring some people. There are spiritual sisters and brothers, spiritual mothers and fathers that God will bring into your life that become your Joshua and your her and that hold your arms up in surrender. And to the degree that your arms are surrendered to God, you start prevailing in the battle, the biggest battle of your life. You are prevailing against the enemy because you are rooted. You are seated on solid principles, a solid foundation, and you've got allies that are holding you up that are praying for you, that are encouraging you, that are sending you scriptures and helping you to be able to battle. I, I felt the anointing come on me sometimes just to wake up and send scriptures to people that are battling cancer and to sometimes encourage them in the Lord to be strong, that God will bring you through this, speaking victory to them because their flesh is naturally getting weary. You're sitting on the rock, but I'm just there to lift up your hand. You need somebody, some allies that are filled with the Word of God that can help hold you up, not push you down, not drain your life force, but add value to you, strengthen you, encourage you, motivate you, empower you to be more than what you are alone. Just remind you, put you back in remembrance of what God has said. It takes us to be able to come to that place to where we lift up our hands. The Bible says without doubt and without wrath. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18. When you come to that place of surrender, you can fight in the battle of the Lord if you've already surrendered. Part of the strategy of winning over the enemy is that we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and the third element is by not loving your life unto death. In other words, you can't be afraid to die. That's why when Esther went in as an intercessor for her people, she wasn't afraid to die. And that's why she said unequivocally that if I perish, I perish. If I die in the midst of this because I'm surrendered, Lord, I give up. I give my life up. I give my will up. I give up my comfort. I give it up. I give up convenience right now. If I die, so be it. Let me die. If I perish, I perish. You can do that when you're sitting on a rock and you've got allies. Because this young girl, Esther, wasn't doing this in her own strength. That was a Mordecai that was holding her arms up. It was a relative. It's a family member that's saying if you live for yourself, you're going to die and you're going to watch all your people die. He said, we're going to die, but he said, because you're one of us, you're going to die too eventually. And if you just try to save yourself, you'll die. Mordecai reminded her, sweetheart, you're here for more than just you. This is bigger than just you. You got to fight for somebody else. May I remind you of this? Greatness is never based on what you get. Greatness is always based on what you give. 
Nobody that we esteem to be great is great because of what they have amassed. They are great because of what they have given. If you ever want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to surrender. 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 And as you surrender to God, you will prevail against the enemy. Give up your pride. To God be the glory. The glory belongs to Him. It's dangerous to be a glory thief. Surrender to Him. Surrender. Surrender. Be seated on a rock. The principles of Jesus Christ. Do you raise your hand in praise and in adoration? Entering into the sanctuary. Lifting hands without wrath and without doubt. Not controlled by a spirit of anger. Not having our minds vacillating and oscillating back and forth with different winds of doctrine and living our own truth but being lucid clearly focused on the one who is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth because the victory belongs to Jesus and he gives it to us it's his battle and as we surrender to say, Lord, that's your child. Lord, that husband that you gave me, that wife that you gave me, I sur Lord, throw your hands up. Surrender. Surrender to it. That son, that daughter that you can't handle, surrender. Lord, I give it up. Whatever you need to do, God. I'm tired of stopping what you're trying to do to correct. Lord, have your way. When you throw your hands up, it's like saying, God, it's out of my hand now. It's in yours. It's in yours. You watch God. You think that you can execute justice better than God? Throw your hands up to him. Say, Lord, this job, Lord, this house, Lord, these children, Lord, this degree. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. Battle ready. Battle ready. Battle ready. Battle ready. Battle ready. When you're really ready to fight the battle, you fight it sitting on a rock. You fight it on your knees with your hands raised. You get in the presence of God and you say, Lord, I give up to you. I surrender to you. Jesus, have your way. I encourage you today. Stand battle ready. Be battle ready. And I just came to remind you as a priest of the Lord that the Lord is with you. That the Lord is fighting for you. Fear not. Because the Lord is giving you the victory. Even as you surrender. And say, Lord, I give up. Because unless you give up, you cannot go up. And it is our way of saying, Lord, I surrender. Now, Lord, you fight and bring favor and advantageous circumstances for victory, for your glory ultimately. Because when the battle is fully consummated and won, we give God the glory. I pray you've received something from his word today. Be seated for just a moment. Bow your heads. If you're in this place, those of you that are joining us through the live stream today, there's a battle for your soul. There's a battle for your peace. There's a battle for the sanity of your mind. There's a battle for your identity. There's a battle for the gifts that God has. The devil is no fool. He'd not go and rob a person who has nothing of value. The thief comes but for to rob, to kill, and to destroy. He'd not come to steal unless you had a treasure from heaven. He knows that you carry treasure. And he's trying to rob you of the destiny of the treasure that you carry on the inside of you. The greatest battle is the battle for the soul. The devil is voting against you. God is voting for you. But your vote casts the winning lot. 
I remind you of like Joshua, choose you this day. Choose this day. Choose wisely whom you will serve. And Joshua made a resolution that as for me and my house, we will serve God. And if you're in this place today and if you feel like your life is out of place with God, if you're joining us through the live stream and you feel that your life is out of place with God, I just want you to just slip one hand up. Say, Lord God, I need you. I want to get in right standing with you. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And I just want you to just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Live in my life. Wash me of my sin. Give me a love for your word, for prayer, and for regular attendance in your house. Cause me from this day forward to never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're here in this place, and if you feel that God has led you to become a member of Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral, I want to invite you to come right now and join God's church. Just stand up right where you are. If anybody wants to join and become a member of Word of Faith today, just stand up because you can make Word of Faith your church home today. If there's anybody who's here that is not already a member of the church and you want to become a member of the church, you can do that today and we'll safely have a place for you. You see these people right here? We've got a safe place of social distancing here. Follow them. Right this direction, right this direction. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome you to the family today. We welcome you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I want to say to those that accepted Christ right where you were, welcome to the family of God. Get into God's Word. The most important thing that you do, I mean, salvation is not the the end of something. It's It's the beginning. It's the beginning of purpose. It's the commencement. A commencement. You're ending all of the insanity that sin has brought into your life. And now we become disciple. You're enrolling in school now to be discipled in the ways of Jesus Christ, to be strengthened. And yes, there will be a battle trying to draw you back into the former lusts of your life, to doing things an unscrupulous way. There's always a lure to try to come back to those things because of the power of a memory. But Jesus has already defeated everything in your past. His blood has already been victorious, and we are grateful to him for the power of the blood. So walk in it. Read your Bible every day. Whisper a prayer to God every day and build a relationship with someone who's mature in Christ and can help you along the way. I want to encourage you to get attached to a local church. Commit your heart. Be rooted, grounded, and planted there. So you can be discipled in the things of God and have a family of allies that's praying with you, believing God with you, and just watch the change that God will bring into your life. If you're making a first-time decision for Jesus, I just want to encourage you, just give us a year of your life and watch and see what God will do. He'll transform you and you'll be unrecognizable a year from now. So we bless you for just being here with us. And thank you for those of you who've tuned in today. May God's spirit rest upon you and give you victory and peace in Jesus' name. And we'll see you next week. God bless you. We love you. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.